Okay. Going. All right. Well, first of all, just once again, want to thank the panelists for taking the time to be here today. Um, I'm excited to hear what they have to say on the subject. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Just before uh, before I take any questions, just understand that for acoustics and for the microphones, since we're recording this for others, I'll try and repeat the questions that you're uh, you're asking. I'm not trying to be a parrot. I'm just uh, trying to make sure that it can get picked up. Okay. Okay. Let's get started. So the topic is servant leadership. Uh, do you have any burning questions before we get started? Um, if not, you're going to have to listen to me. <laughs> what is servant leadership? Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll mark that one off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is, what what is servant leadership? So. Um, just open it up to each of the panelists to give us like a short description of what you see as servant leadership. We can start with, <laughs> we can start with you. That's a, a really great question. Okay. Um, when I was asked to join the panel, I thought, wow, is that really what I am? I think in a nutshell, it's the ability and the desire to build a great team and to trust that team and to get out of the way. So I think it's just supporting the people that you have on your team and just get the hell out of the way. Yeah, um, my, my perspective is um, <coughs> servant leadership is, is more about assuming a role of facilitating for your team rather than driving your team. It's setting up an infrastructure where they have all the tools and uh, the, the criteria for success all laid out for them and then stepping back, like Karen says, and just letting them go for it. Uh, and then be there along the way, uh, be the water stations, be the, be the cheerleader, whatever you want to call it, um, and, and to be there to step in and, and remove roadblocks and to let them find their own path to success and to be there all along the way. So yet, I think if leadership is a, a continuum and, and there's two styles, on one end you have command and control, which is like, I'm the boss, I'll do whatever I'll get it done, I'll make people do it. And on the other end is support and develop. So you're helping others succeed and moving along. So instead of thinking of your job as a leader is to command and get everyone to do what you want, it's the other side of that. Help them do what they want. Mark? So I'm gonna take a little bit of a slightly different stance and say that it's much more encompassing than just what you do for a living. This goes to all of your walks of life, now until the day you expire. So this is not just a work thing. Servant leadership is about being in a community and serving there. Your family, serving there. Uh, the world, you might volunteer or you might, it's serving in with every breath that you take. Ken Blanchard is a, one of the most well-known speakers, writers, 60 books on this topic. And he likes to separate the two words a little bit and then bring, bring everything back together and put a nice little bow on it at the very end. So he describes leadership as being that, uh, that vision, the direction. Not directions, because directions turn left, turn right. That's, that's not what leadership is. It's just direction. And uh, he more or less leaves it at that and then talks about ser the servant side as the implementation, the how. And so there he talks about various topics and that's what all of his books and his seminars and workshops and so on are about how. Uh, but the, the bow on top is that it's, it's, it's all walks of life. Um, and the continuum, as, as uh, John said, is you know, from command and control to servant leadership. Uh, another way that that's said is uh, by many of the people that I've interviewed, they talk about selfish leaders. You've probably met some <laughs> in your life. Uh, all the way to selfless. So two similar words with extreme opposite uh, meanings. And so selfish to s servant is uh, 
is what it is. Okay, thank you. So just, uh, I've got a question, uh, just based off of that. Then if, if we take that continuum of selfish versus, you know, self-seeking, and I think implicitly we've all worked for managers that, that we can tell, you know, which side they're on fairly quickly. They, they try and mask it, but you can kind of see where people's true intentions are. What are some ways that you feel like, um, given that definition and, and the responses, how, how do you actually apply it, let's say, in the workplace with, uh, with particular like employees that you work with? I, I've heard some, I heard, heard the panelists say, yes, you know, it's empowering your employees, but how do you go, what are some tactical things that you do? Maybe just one. Um, to help uh, empower or to, to ex exemplify servant leadership? How's that for a big question? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say one of the things that I do, if, if, if I am approached with how do we solve this, I return that around and say, you tell me, how, sh how should we solve this? Okay. Right, Good. to just give them the power to, to make a decision and, and support that decision they make. Okay, Yeah, for me, I mean, it's, it really comes down to knowing your employees. If you're not aware of who they are, what motivates them, what their personalities are, you can't effectively look for opportunities to, to serve that person. And so I think the efforts that I make is to really get to know my employees and the types of individuals that they are. And then, <coughs> again, if, if, if you're able to hire very uh, self-managed and, and people that take initiative and that are, that are rolling, my job really comes back to, rather than worrying about um, trying to get people or train people and get them to do what they need to be doing, it becomes more of a, you know, what can I do to, to help them and, and to be there for them. But I, I like what Mark said about it, it really being more than just uh, a management level thing. Um, it, at our company, we provide lots of opportunities to be mentors. Every time a new, a new employee comes in, that person needs to be mentored. And all of my senior designers, all the way down to my junior designers, have opportunities to mentor. Um, and, and kind of setting up an infrastructure of us taking care of each other, it automatically gravitates to um, that mentorship being, uh, I mean, sought after and wanting to help someone. And, and being able to, to help that person come and acclimate into the company. So, lots of opportunity. Excellent. Any other comments? Uh, I, I would just add that one, one specific thing at work that everyone should do, it, it sort of emphasizes this idea of servant leadership, is you, when you work for a corporation, you have you know, HR and you have all these kind of teams set up to basically manage everything for you, they manage compensation and everything like that. But you're, if you're a manager, your team doesn't have anyone going to bat for them except for you as a manager. So you have to be like their agent. And one thing that's very specific, very tactical, is get your team paid more money. Like look at, look at what they're making, and if they're not getting the amount of money that they should get, it's your job to, as a, their servant, if you want to, if we're using that language, to get them more money. Make sure they're getting paid equally. Make sure they're getting paid as much as they're worth. You've got these guys at the top that are making like 200 times what you're making probably. And there should, you should never feel bad about trying to get someone more money. And by doing that, no one else is going to bat for them. They shouldn't have to do that yourself. And a lot of people don't do that themselves because they feel like, oh, I just I have a good job and I'm just happy and I'll work along. But they might be they might be struggling, they might not be getting paid enough, they might not even know it, and you have to do that for them. Just it's just a, a simple thing. Yeah. It is actually simple. A lot of times you can just go talk to the the compensation manager of your company and say, This person, I don't think they're getting paid enough, and they'll look at pull up their charts and say, Oh, you're right, they're on the low end of our range. And you say, and they're a high performer, and they say, yep, they should be getting paid this much money, and they'll make an adjustment at their term when they do it. But it's it's not that hard as a manager to do that. That's a good point. Anyone else, Mark? Do you have a? I'd not like to echo what everyone said. Those are all absolutely true, um, and I would more once again uh, sort of generalize and say it's just one word. It's love. Uh, 
it's the agape kind of love, obviously. It's not uh, anything creepy. But uh, it, it's, it's about caring. And if you don't care, you, you can't call yourself a, an aspiring servant leader. But if you truly care, if you love them person to person, then you'll get to know them. You'll go to bat for them. Um, you'll do what you, that you can and get out of the way. Uh, and so that's, that's what it boils down to. Find it in you to love those around you. And the other thing about leadership is that most people equate leadership with management. And sure, that's a style of leadership. It's people leadership, isn't it? Uh, but I claim that there are a great many people that are people leaders. Mahatma Gandhi, for example, did, was he a manager of a ton of people? No, he was a people leader. Uh, and so encourage those around you to, uh, to lead to influence. So if leadership is quite simply influence, John Maxwell, that's a quote from him, it's, it's influence, nothing more, nothing less, then your individual contributors, uh, and you may be one, uh, you can lead just as effectively and perhaps even more broadly than a manager can. And so you have process leaders, you have thought leaders, you have people leaders. Encourage all forms of leadership. And uh, you'd be surprised the lights that will go on if, if you simply are there to encourage them to lead. Awesome. Thank you. Questions? One here, and then we'll go back to that. So in the role of a servant leader, do you find you have to define that for people on your team? You have to explain what servant leadership is? Or they just immediately get it, and once they get it, do they approach it differently going forward? So the question was, um, if I can sum up what you're asking, correct me if I'm wrong, but do you have to explain what servant leadership is to people? Is it something that you have to do training around, or at least um, you know coaching around? Is that yeah? Or are we just assuming that because we know what it is, everybody on my team understands what it is and why it's of value to them? Okay. And I'll leave that open to anybody who wants to field that question. I, I never really thought of, I've never thought about it that way as far as being like, but we're all going to adopt this philosophy and do and do things this way. For me, it's like, don't be an asshole. <laughs> like, it's just like, we're going to try to do things in a way. I'm not going to be like trying to climb the ladder and trying to make um, myself big. I'm going to try to help the team get what they want. And, and help things go better. So I, I don't know if I would think of it. I think you could do that if you're, if you're, if you have a team that you want to do it in a structured way. But I've never really thought about it that way myself. It's more like I want to do things. I want to try to be help them. I mean, you brought up the point of this. It's like you got to care for your people, and and hopefully by example you're going to make that that work out. Um, if you're trying to like teach a whole organization this new philosophy, like quit acting like jerks and act like a better way, you might need to, to do, get this guy as a consultant <laughs> on the topic. And, and, and then you might really want to talk about it as a, like this is a specific leadership thing, style that we're trying to change. But and I don't know, I never really thought about it that way. Especially if it's like a culture change. In my mind, if, if, if you've got a systematic issue, then, then it does make sense to probably do some right. training and stuff. Around. Most people just, they get it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I think I was lucky enough to have several mentors early in my career that just did it this way. So I never realized I was gleaning that from them until my current team says, hey, you're an incredible servant leader. I was like, okay, if that works for you guys, that's what I am. Let's just go this path and let's figure it out. But it, I just replicated what worked for me in previous lives. So. Yeah. I don't think you need to educate. I think it just feels right when you get it right. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't think any yeah. of us before this meeting came in and said, right. I'm a self-leader. <laughs> I'm a leader. leader. That's me. <laughs> right. um, but I think to expand on that a little bit, for those of you that work in startups or that have startup experience, you notice probably that the culture of the company in startup mode 
reflects the CEO's personality and, and what they're like as a leader and it trickles down. Once that company starts to mature, then the individual department heads start to trickle down from their personalities, from their actions to create subcultures. And so for me, I've just found that just by just leading out and setting that example and, and setting that kind of as an expectation, not necessarily getting after people, but um, rewarding people when they, or recognizing people when they make those efforts, that that culture just starts to begin. And I think you generally turn people off when you say, this is what we're doing from here on out, and you have to now adjust to it. Um, I think a lot of people, especially within uh, product management and UX, probably turn off to that. But if you, if you lead out, you'll be more likely to get people to respond. Some, something you said, though, you said people will just get it. And I think that there's a lot of people who don't get it. <laughs> like, there are people who believe <laughs> that the way to, the way to manage or to, to be is the command and control style. Like if you want to be good at your job as an executive or a leader, then you need to tell people what to do. You need to criticize them so that they step up their behavior and you need to you know, get rid of them if they're, if they're not doing what you want. And so I think that they're, I, you know, I, I don't know, like how you would change a culture or something like that would be I'm not sure how you would do that. I'm thinking kind of, per what I said was more like personal. I don't, I never really thought about talking about it that way with the team. And I guess the basis of my question is, we just assume everyone understands it, but is it possible that not everyone understands it, so they're getting left out in some ways? Because they don't realize that there's someone there that would help them. <coughs> they just need to ask. Absolutely. Uh, but the intuition side says that not everybody gets it, but there's a lot of proof out there too. Uh, we talked about that, that command and control style. It's, it's the human ego is what's fundamentally at work there. And uh, all of us, it, even though we're aspiring servant leaders or some of us maybe have already, definitely not I, uh, have already achieved that sort of status, but uh, you know, even we have a certain amount of ego, and uh, and and humility, though, is the reflection of what's going on on the inside of that ego. Uh, but let's see, it was C.S. Lewis who said, um, uh, "Oh gosh, I can't remember the exact quote, but." Look it up. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> uh, it's the world's greatest quote on humility. Um, uh, if somebody could help me out, that would be really great. Um, but definitely look that one up. Yeah, I think, I think what you're getting at, too, is that humility isn't necessary. I mean, it's something, what I've heard from you is that it's something you embody. That if you really care about other people, that you, you start to create it as a character trait, whether it's from people that you've worked with that, that have mentored you, or it's just simply in your kind of DNA, right? Well, it wasn't in my DNA until I s discovered it. I was raised as uh, you know, in a kind of household where you know children are seen but not heard. This is your box, and uh, so I describe this as the duty to servant or service continuum. Uh, I was raised all the way over here, and uh, in that household, it was my job to do X, Y, and Z, and I was wanted to be a good little boy and be inside of that box. Uh, and then there's this other continuum. Good parents can you know, be on the duty side, but good parents can also be on the service or servant side. And this really was driven home to me after I got married to my wonderful wife, who is in the audience, uh, the greatest servant leader that I know. Kim uh, was raised in a servant leadership household. And so you can raise your children to be <coughs> servant leaders, or you can raise them to do exactly what you say in a command and control way, like I raised my kids because that's how I was raised. And so uh, the bottom line here is that not all of us sort of just woke up one day and said, oh yeah, I guess that's kind of my style. 
I had to adopt it. I had to learn it. And I've done so largely through interviewing people and understanding their tips and tricks and concrete, actionable uh, things. And that's what I want to put in the book. Uh, that's exactly what I want people to get from it, is concrete, actionable things that you can do uh, to learn and practice servant leadership. Thank you. Let's, let's go with Dylan first and then yeah, he had a question. I want to make sure we have enough time to get through all your questions. Go ahead. So Mark, a moment ago you talked about how um, in order to really have those relationships you need to really love your team or care for your team, right? So I'm curious as to what it is that you guys do to help establish that level of a relationship uh, genuinely uh, and how does that change? So I guess this is a two-part question. How does that change as your team grows and there's more people to establish those relationships with? <coughs> that, that, that's an amazing question. So I'll uh, point to um, uh, Michael Dell. I had the pleasure of working way under him. I'm taking your second question first. Way, way, way under him. I was a software engineer. I was writing code. And I was breaking the factory floor. He probably knew about that, but he had no idea that it, I was at fault. Uh, but he stopped by my office one day. I didn't know who he was. Uh, I was actually just coding. And the door was here. And he was talking to my office mate. And uh, he was saying, how's it going? T tell me about your challenges. And I had no idea who this was. And uh, when the guy left, my office mates, did you know that was Michael Dell, CEO? And I, no, I, I sure didn't. But you can serve your people no matter who you are in leadership. Uh, or whether you are a manager, doesn't matter. Uh, and your first question was more around what teamwork. Is it, what is it and that you're doing? How to foster it, what exactly you're doing. Uh, oops, spilled my dream. Um, so I'll point to a book that uh, I, re I interviewed the author of. It's called You Are the Team, Six Simple Ways to Go from Good to Great. It's by Michael uh, G. Rogers, lives in Cedar, Cedar City, Utah, uh, has seven children, uh, and he is uh, the epitome of servant leader. Uh, that book is really great. Uh, if you happen to be a manager, <coughs> buy it for your team. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so you can do that. You can have a sort of a book club and, and read that. Uh, it talks about servant leadership a bit in there. Uh, or you can simply uh, do as Les did, or said, um, espouse it and, and support. Okay, thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm, I was just curious, so and in... Sorry, you know, any others? I, I sort of dominated there and I didn't mean <laughs> to. <laughs> I, I, I would any say, other? you just, you have to give, one thing you can do is just give up Control controls on that other side, and you just you have to give that up so that you can focus on the, the person, not the not the project. It's really hard. I mean, you 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 got promoted or got to the position you're in because you you did like the work, and you maybe you got there at some point, and you have to when you take over that as a leader. You have to you kind of give that up. So you're no longer there to do the work. You've got someone else. You have to give up control and trust them to do it, and support them in doing it and to support them you need to build empathy with them understand just how what is going on in their life are they happy are they making enough money are they are they what are the challenges they have with the work and thing and focus on the things around that instead of to becoming a micromanager and focus on control yeah i think if you show that you care and the the team becomes to do the starts to do this exact same thing everyone starts to care for each other and it could be something as small as you have you know, jokes between the team, there's laughter in the team, there's a lot of small things that happen that show that you care. You know, there's a lot of books out there that say, lean in when you're talking to someone. A lot of small things like that really build up the team and make you feel like you're a cohesive unit and you're more of a family than just coworkers that are hanging out together. Yeah. One more thing to add to that <coughs> is 
to notice when your team members are down, whether it's Absolutely. in their career, whether it's at home, be in tune to, to, to see that happening and then take opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one interactions around that topic and let them know that you're there, be there to listen for, to them, and uh, spend as much time as you can getting them to talk about themselves and hardly talk about yourself. And that's, you build those connections of trust and, and then it comes naturally. Excellent, thank you. It's actually a good segue into my question, which is around, you know, how, where, where do you, have you guys found the balance between, you know, letting someone, you know, experiment, learn on their own, you know, a lot of times some of the same lessons that you've already learned in your career versus, you know, sometimes needing to step in and like make, you know, either because they're heading down a direction that could you know, be catastrophic for the business or, you know, where, where is that balance between letting someone, you know, stretch their wings versus, you know, helping redirect them? Yeah, what, uh, do you want to take them if you're out or want to put you on the spot? No, I'm on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I'm more on, yeah, I don't, don't want to make the seat hot on top of the spot. I think, you know, I feel like it's, it's almost intuitive in most cases where you're so close with your, your teammates already and you're checking in with them on a daily basis. You have a good feel. I typically have a good feel, though. And I say that. I'm going to go to the office tomorrow and realize something's blowing up. But I feel like there's just an awareness of when things may be going off the rails. And if, if you're continuously checking in and making sure things are, are going well, you got a good gauge of, oh wait, maybe we should think about doing it this way. Or what do you think about this path? So just get the gentle nudges when you sense things may be going off the rails. Like, you know, let's, let's put up the, uh, what are the bumpers call, called? Yeah, yeah, but at the bowling alley, is that what it's called? The bumpers. Yeah, bumpers. That, there we go. Yeah, put up the bumpers <laughs> and then take the bumpers back down. Good. Anyone else? Yeah, I would say that it's, it's rare that somebody's going to go down the path that's destructive to the company. Um, and there, there may be something that's a little risky. There may be something where maybe they're spending time on something that's not as effective as another way. And so giving them, you know, some room to go out and explore that and then see where it goes and then you know kind of bring them back in and say this is a great idea let's table this and let's get this done so that we can have time to do those things in the future or um, the other thing is, is that's important is to have uh, a support system around them that's not just you as a manager to build sub teams that are there to collaborate with one another on a regular basis and then they help each other and they become those bumper bars excellent thank you anyone else want to fill that okay Excellent. Other questions? Yes, here in the back. So I'm just curious, we've kind of heard the, the good side of this. What are the behaviors and traits and things that people embody in leadership that bug you? <laughs> okay. So the things that uh, maybe on the flip side of this, the things that irritate you or, or um, are you talking about employees or other so people? Yeah, like, you are definitely not heading down the path of servant leadership. What is it about that behavior? Like in your mind you say, it bugs me when people do this certain thing, or it, it drives me nuts when dot, dot, dot. How would you define that? And you mean specific to leadership? Yes. <laughs> All right, <now, laughs> you want to feel that. Well, there's, this, there's a book called, and this is a great book, you should read it. It's called The Asshole Survival Guide <laughs> by Robert Sutton. And it is it describes all of these behaviors that, that you see on the on the flip side of it. These are he I mean he um, in that book anyway, it's just, it goes over all those things. Like when when your boss treats you like dirt. I mean when you feel like you're in a position where you know you're being told what to do and not given the autonomy to do it, when you are told you have to earn trust rather than <coughs> given the trust. Um, I, you know, I think that when, when people start talking about that they, they didn't, get, I didn't get credit for that, like, like why didn't I get credit, or I want to, I want to present my idea, you know, just like the, pol the politicking, I guess, politic, politics in the office, <laughs> of what's going on and how to, and you can see that kind of behavior called ladder climbing, like people that position themselves into that spot where they can they can get things, talk bad about other people so they can get promoted. I mean, there's 
there's so many things like that that just I mean you go in the office every day and you'd want to quit because of all these kinds of things anywhere I think these exist anywhere and you probably I know that I do I have some of those things that I probably do myself that if other people see it they're like it drives me crazy I mean it's it's hard but a lot of I don't know read the, read the book and it's got them all laid out and you'll be like oh my gosh this is it I see this all the time <laughs> so. other questions yes how do you manage conflicting personalities within your team you have two people who maybe are getting along do you step in or do you usually let them take care of that on their own good question do you when you've got two uh, team members in conflict uh, do you step in to address those or do you let them work it out themselves was the question correct correct okay I, personally I think you need to react to that uh, very quickly otherwise it's just going to continue to spiral out of control um, I think talking to each party individually getting their side of the story understanding how they're feeling about the situation um, and then see if you can guide things or if you're talking on the same team not product manager UX right. within the same team you can find ways if you need to to separate them if it really gets out of control to an extreme but I mean, we should all be professionals at this point in our career. We should uh, be able to acknowledge that, okay, maybe there's something I can do differently to help the situation once it's brought to my attention. If that doesn't happen, then, you know, it's, that's when you take more drastic uh, measures. But I think it's important to really sit down and understand the situation from each, each side of the story first. Okay. Any other comments? I'd say that you know the few times I've had this happen, I've coached both parties to get to know the other person a little bit better, see things from their perspective. Um, and this, of course, is when it's not in an, a, an awful state where it's gotten to a crisis point just yet. Um, it's just like, get to know this person. Reach out to them, you know, see if you can work things out together. And it's not a confrontation at this point. It's more of, if you're in a room, you can tell this person bristles up when the other person makes a suggestion. So I tell this person, I coach them, I've noticed that you have some, some issues whenever this person's you know, making a comment or, or making a suggestion, you know, maybe try to work with them a little bit more. You know, what's, what's bugging you about that person? And then the same thing over here and kind of directing them and suggest, why don't you guys go to lunch together? Did you know you both have children? Did you know you both have legs? Go figure this out. <laughs> Good, excellent, thank you. Mark, you had a comment? Uh, I was raising my hand to say exactly what she just said, <laughs> so I now have nothing to say. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. That's You're welcome. okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That's okay, excellent, thank just you. Add, I'll just add one thing that, mm -hmm. it's, it's just important in, in all of that, when the situation comes up, you just have to keep the, you have to keep the mindset that both both people are it could be situational that's not bad and good and one one side or the other and you might have to just you manage the situation not the people in the, or even their behaviors it could just be purely situational it's like the first thing to look at is well circumstances or situation or something and not the pe people if you think it's the people right off then you're probably down a bad that down a bad path you have to pick sides, you have to make judgments, and if you can stay away from that as long as possible, probably better off. <laughs> Actually, I take it back. I do want to add one thing. <laughs> uh, and that is when, when doing that coaching, uh, the, the term open, honest, and direct, all three terms um, need to apply uh, so that the person feels permission to actually go to that person that they've had conflict with and to be open, to be honest, and to be direct. Don't dance around. Encourage them to not dance around the issue and say, well, you know, it's, I'm feeling kind of this way. No, ask them to be direct. Um, and obviously not an a-hole like the, the, the non-servant leaders, uh, the selfish leaders out there. Uh, would do. Okay. Actually, one more thing. Sorry, I thought of this example as, as Mark was saying that. I had a, a recent example where I had our scrum master, our head of development, and our head of QA kind of dancing around each other a good bit. So, send out a meeting invite. We're going to have a Festivus meeting. And each of you, <laughs> each of you bring three things that annoy you about the rest of us. And I attended as well. 
So Bearing be honest. Answers. Let's be honest. <laughs> and you have to be completely candid. And everyone was like, no, 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 we can't do this. We can't do this. The QA guy comes and says, I don't have anything. Bullshit. Bring something. <laughs> got four days. Think about it. And so we had that meeting, and everyone was nervous in the beginning. Mm -hmm. At the end, it's laughter. Everyone's having a great time. QA guy told the dev, dev guy, you're never on time in meetings, and it drives me nuts. And so now, whenever he's a minute, two minutes late, they're like, you're late. And they just poke fun now at each other because they know the things that drive the people crazy. And they're trying to address that. That was the first Festivus we had. And I'm sure we're going to have several more. <laughs> just because we got it started, right? You get it started, and now let's see how much fun we can have with it. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll let the awkward silence sit there while you think. Go ahead. I, you know, as we talk about this, I, I kind of goes back to the book Good to Great. He talks about level five leader, and it has to do with uh, being uh, humble and having some uh, personal will or professional will. I think is how he classifies it. Strong will. Anyway, it, it seems like anytime you add humility in the mix, you, you're kind of asking to get walked over to some extent, and you can get burned um, by that front. Any any insights there? How you can be a good Diplomatic leader leading out in front, while at the same time not being, you know, so easygoing that you're you're too much on the friend zone. You get walked over. This goes question. back to that C.S. Lewis quote: "If somebody looked it up, <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I took notes to look it up. Humility is not thinking less of your of yourself; it's thinking of yourself less. Bingo. <laughs> That's the one. That's the one." really critical I think you know with your question also the just the, the idea of getting walked over some people we, we talked a little bit in the beginning that there are people who have a different philosophy and they view that they would view they read that book or they, they might get it I don't know I would imagine in my head some people that I've met and know they read they'd read even the idea of servant leadership they'd say that's weak that's weak weak leaders um, are like that you know they don't they don't stand up or whatever and that's a that's a challenge I mean that is a real tough thing how do you do it when you're it's like well I know that this is the best way to be as a human being to, to, to just treat people this way and try my best to help help everyone and if that's viewed above you or in some other way as weakness what do you do I don't I don't have a really good answer for that but it's a real I think it's a real question I like you guys got answers it's <laughs> all snap. So, so as a manager, this is a little bit easier. If you're a peer leader, it's a little bit more difficult, uh, especially if you're getting walked on by your manager. Uh, as a manager, though, I think your team will notice what you're doing outside of the department, um, seeing that you're not getting walked over by other peer leaders or your direct manager. Um, that's there's opportunities there to defend your team and to take more bold action. Um, to expand the team or to get raises, things like that. If they're seeing you do that, uh, they, they understand that that's not tolerated because just because you're being humble or serving them doesn't mean that you're going to get walked over. As a peer leader, like I said, it becomes a little bit more difficult, especially when your department doesn't have that culture. Although I think one thing that we haven't mentioned yet is that within UX, and I won't speak for product management, but our role really is to be a servant. In, in our field. We are looking out for our users, we're defending them, we're empathizing with them. That's, it should come naturally for us. Um, but if for some reason your department doesn't carry that, um, again, you just need to stand up for <coughs> yourself and serve the people that are serving back first. I don't know, that's a tougher one. Yep. I'd say if you sense it, you gotta say something about it. And maybe you take that person to the side, whoever it might be that you feel like is walking over you or is about to step on you and say, hey, you know, what's, what's going on? And address that as you can. It's like, you know, defend, you know, go along with the team as long as you can. And then if something happens where the breach is being, or the, the, the what have you is being breached, then you gotta defend the team. So there's actually hard data, direct correlation between servant leadership and employee happiness and retention. Uh, hard data from a PhD, uh, Dr. Kumar out of Bangalore, India, uh, made servant leadership his entire PhD dissertation, and he did a phenomenal job with the research. 
and it's an absolutely direct correlation. Uh, and that's what you can tell the naysayers. That's what you can point to. I'd be happy after this to, to point you to the research um, that, that says, oh, that's weak, that's not a great style, or you know, it's, it's better to be command and control because you, you get what you need out of the organization. You can get what you need out of the organization through this style better and with higher uh, job satisfaction in everyone, including yourself, <laughs> if you uh, adopt this style. Again, regardless of whether you're a manager or not. Thank you. Any other, I thought I saw a couple of hands here with uh, some questions. I mean, kind of, kind of a follow up question to, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Sure. Jordan. Um, do you believe it's possible to be too friendly as manager? Is it, yes, yeah, so the question was, is it possible to be too friendly? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, define friendly, though. Are you talking well, about that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, uh, just, just, because um, you're talking about, like, trying to get to know your, your employees on kind of a personal level. Is there a time that you've come across or maybe that was taken? advantage of in some way. Okay. Um, I have seen that. And um, it, it's taken advantage of in a way where the employee is trying to get away with doing less work, trying to do maybe take a little bit too much time off, things like that. And so that's where it, it comes into showing that you're not going to get, get uh, kind of walked all over by, if you, if you build a framework for people to succeed, there's boundaries. And those boundaries need to be defined within the department. And they need to be written down and explained as to what it means to be successful and then know that the opposite of that is not tolerated, in a sense. And so uh, when, when people are taking advantage of those types of situations, that's when crucial conversations come in and during one-on-ones and you start to address those situations and be bold in those situations. But you can do it in a humble way still, uh, where you're still asking, um, I noticed that you're leaving work early a lot. Tell me what's going on. Is there something in your life? And if nothing comes of that, or if you know they're trying to explain something that maybe doesn't deserve what they're doing, uh, you can bring that to their attention. But I think you're still, at the end of the day, have to be a manager if there's people reporting to you, and you have to address situations. So yes, people absolutely will try to take advantage of it, certain people. One thing that stood out to me listening to your comments is um, you're asking questions. Like, you you know, you know, mentioned it less, so did you, Karen. Like, I implicitly in your conversation, you, you're, you're asking those employees questions so that when, when there's an issue that comes up, you're asking probing questions to get them to respond and maybe reveal some of their motivations for why they're doing that, which I think you know, I'm taking notes myself here. That's great. Absolutely. Well, I was just going to say, your question was, can you be too nice? And maybe, you know, can you care too much? It's like, no, you can't. You can, right. you can always care more, but you can, you know, is, if you think of it as service, are you serving them to protect them or to not, not bring up issues or things like that? If you really want to serve them, you need to bring up those issues, address them quickly, you know, make things clear, make sure they know where the boundaries are. It's just like, yeah. Both of ours. Yeah. And, and the other thing you got to look at, you got to serve the rest of the team. If the rest of the team is performing at a high rate and there's people that aren't, you need to serve the other team by taking care of that situation. Yeah. And I think what you guys have mentioned too, the one-on-ones have to be regular. You have to have those on a regular basis no matter what. Mm -hmm. And that's how you kind of get a good grip on what's going on with a, sp a specific person and the team as, as a whole. Those are really crucial. Interestingly, I actually had feedback that I was being too nice once. Uh, no, twice. Um, one from a peer and one from an executive that was way nosebleed. Um, <laughs> and the executive said, uh, Mark, some, some people uh, really appreciate that you're the energizer bunny. And other people, it drains them. And she said, you're, you're too nice, you're too excited, you're just it down a little and 
I, I was flabbergasted. It never occurred to me that, that my energy could drain people. And uh, I, I really started looking into that, and it turns out to, it's absolutely true. You can be too nice slash too much energy. Uh, and so that's where asking questions, um, the empathy, and getting to know people really is critical. So that was maybe 10 years ago that I got that feedback, and I, I've tried my best to tamp down my extroverted, you know, uh, smiley self. But uh, nevertheless, there, there's no such thing as too many smiles. So. Thank you. So we have about five minutes left. Uh, if we don't have any burning questions, I wanted to give the panel kind of an opportunity to just, you know, give us some last parting thoughts, uh, you know, around this that maybe we haven't addressed yet uh, through questions. Any comments? If not, we can we can go back to some questions. A any burning comments? Burning. If not, I think we got one question here. Sorry, I have, uh, so sorry, I have one question. Um, what kind of advice would you give to a future leader or someone who wants to be, become a leader? What kind of advice could you give to help shape them? I liked your uh, the mentorship and that. I thought it was really nice. But any other advice you could give would be great. Additional advice on helping others to become leaders. You should repeat That's yours, Sean. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> 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 <Yes>. <laughs> that way. <laughs> so it just so happens that what I was had a burning comment mm -hmm. about was exactly the answer to that question. Exactly. Uh, and that is listen. So yes, you ask questions, uh, but you do that through the process of listening. And uh, I learned, a while back, I learned a method. Um, a great servant leader taught me this method uh, of listening. And it's, uh, think of it as a process. The method is called HEAR, H-E-A-R. And yes, that's an acronym, and I'm going to tell you all about it. Uh, so first you halt. Halt to your inner thoughts, your inner judgments your inner perceptions. Then you empathize. And that one's a little bit more complex, but if you just think about being in their shoes, and if you actually practice being in the shoes of others regularly, uh, it'll definitely help you empathize better. Uh, and so the attempt is to see what they see, hear what they hear, walk how they walk, etc. A, anticipate learning something new. You could be talking to a child and listen via the hear method. Anticipate learning something you didn't know before this person says so. And then finally reflect. And that's not just in the moment. Reflect afterwards, too. And sometimes you need to say, to listen properly, you need to say, I really need to take what you said to heart. I'm going to go reflect on that, and, and I'll get back to you tomorrow, or whenever. Um, set a date, though. Set a time that you'll get back to them. Uh, but if it's in the moment, then you can still reflect. You can use reflective listening. Repeat, but in your words, perhaps, or if I heard you correctly, you're really upset that Joe is not listening to you at all. Is that right? And the, the grin, the, the emotion that they'll be expressing is, oh my gosh, my management is actually listening to me, if you're a manager. Or my peer, my coworker, my across the hall mate, is listening, and that matters. That's how you get to know people. Make, th make sure that they know you know how to listen. It's the most difficult skill sometimes to master, 
But if you follow that process, even if it's quickly in your head, halt, empathize, anticipate learning something, and reflect, uh, you will go far. Okay, thank you. Um, we're at time now, so uh, just want to thank the panelists for uh, taking their time to answer the questions and impart their wisdom and knowledge for the rest of us. We're all slashing. Let's